So yesterday saw Wolf Speed stock soar 30% on the back of their fiscal 2022 earnings report. And I don't know if I'm the only one that gets peeved at firms that use fiscal, which just confuses everybody, but uh, more or less they announced their year end, which would have included the fourth quarter of fiscal 2022. And there was some good news in there. And we'll talk about why that is, but that prompted us to take a closer look at a firm that we last looked at three years ago and which sits in our report and tech stock catalog as a like, which means we'd consider purchasing the stock. So it's been a while since we've looked at Wolf Speed. That's what we're going to do today. Now, our story starts with um, a, a bit of a side journey here. So I first learned about silicon carbide, which is the material that we're going to talk about today. Uh, I first learned about it when I was traveling in the Marshall Islands. Now I've drawn a little blue X on this map. And to the right of that X, you can see Hawaii. To the south of that, uh, Papua New Guinea. North of that, Japan. So you can see that this island, this small little island here called Kwajalein, is in the middle of nowhere and it belongs to the Marshall Islands and the United States government pays them, I don't know, I recall it's in the range of $12 million a year, which is a lot of income for this small country that predominantly survives on harvesting tuna. And the US Army has a garrison there at this atoll with about a thousand people and they do all kinds of interesting things there. So they run missile tests and they'll actually shoot missiles in, I think from, Cape Canaveral, and then they'll land in that vicinity and everybody gets out in the uh, field and watches when the missiles come by. And it's a really interesting place. And one of the um, gentlemen that works for Nanalyze, our editor in chief, he spent some time there, uh, very interesting fellow. He was the only full-time journalist in Antarctica. And he's also spent time here at Kwajalein. So he wrangled me an invite. And after getting approval and the background checks, I flew in and spent a week on this atoll. Well, while I was there, I took some cool pictures like this uh, C-130 Hercules landing from uh, Nevada. And you can see in the background of this picture, those bubbles. Well, there's a um, lot of sophisticated monitoring equipment on this island, as you can imagine. And one of the things that they recently built is the world's most advanced radar. It's called Space Fence by Lockheed Martin. And I spoke with the engineers that had built that and it generates so much power that you're not allowed to climb on a ladder without a permit. And of course I was climbing all over the berms on the island and you're not supposed to do that because the radiation is so powerful. And they had to build their own power plant to power the a uh, space radar that can track 10 times as much space junk as whatever system that was in place prior to that. It can actually detect in space objects the size of marbles. How can it do something so extraordinary? Well, the key to this radar system is something called silicon carbide. And I wanted to just give a short history here of this particular material. So it's a wafer of silicon and carbon compressed together. So it would be uh, part of the semiconductor industry. And in 2017, Elon Musk and his um, first principles thinking where he sort of reinvents uh, everything without relying on what's already been built. He kind of builds everything from the bottom up. He decided to use silicon carbon in Tesla's traction inverter. So that's a very important component of an electric vehicle. What it does is it converts the direct current stored in the battery to alternating current that's used to power the motors. So this particular material is far superior to silicon and by using it, batteries can be smaller, they can last longer, and what's remarkable about it is the higher the voltage, the more efficient it becomes, the faster the battery charges. So it also allows for rapid charging. And when you incorporate this into the design of an electric vehicle, several hundred dollars more to use SICK instead of the alternative translates to about $2,500 in savings through better vehicle design. So it's a win-win all the way around. And as the technology improves, larger wafers can be produced, which lowers the cost of production, which spurs adoption. And that's exactly what's happening now. So here is the 
Bull thesis for silicon carbide. You see here we have three areas and the uh, chart here shows the growth of each over time every several years. And you can see that automotive is the fastest growing with a 30% compound annual growth. So uh, followed by inverters, um, well, inverters are actually a part of the automotive market at 80%. So this diagram in the upper right here shows the automotive opportunity, what percentage of that would be inverters in fiscal year 2026. After automotive, which is all about electric vehicles, we then look at the second biggest opportunity, which would be uh, industrial and energy. So think about renewable energy, you have solar inverters and wind blades and all the different components there. And more importantly, 45% uh, of the world's energy powers commercial motors. So there's a huge opportunity there. And then RF, that makes up the opportunity for 5G devices. So this isn't a bad place to be when you think about themes. You've got renewable energy, 5G and electric vehicles. Wow, so that's quite compelling. And I think that's one of the reasons why when we looked at Wolf Speed before, we were quite interested in particular because they're a leader. We love investing in market leaders. So they have a long-term stable market share of 60% in sick wafers. They're the leading supplier and recognized as a leader, which means they have the intellectual property to defend their position. And what they're doing now is adding capacity so that they can maintain leadership and meet the demand for silicon carbide, which is very high. So here's a um, diagram that shows what they're doing. So essentially they're moving from a 150 millimeter wafer to a 200 millimeter wafer and what this allows them to do is produce more devices from a single wafer. So instead of six vehicles, they can now do 20 vehicles. And essentially they're getting more than three times the yield from a wafer, yet it only costs them 20% more to produce. So what does that do? That increases, expands their margins. And the 200 millimeter wafers were first announced in 2015 and the world's first factory in New York just started production. So the economies of scale that they're going to realize help lower costs, that increases the use cases. So that's probably the uh, most exciting thing going at Wolf Speed right now is this huge factory. You can see here how it compares in size to their other locations, what they call bare die manufacturing. So it's it's a massive place and they actually received a $500 million grant from the state of New York, that's pretty nice, to be able to build this uh, factory and it's now going into production. So in June, uh, which would have been several months back, uh, it was supposed to have had production start. So they're now starting to crank out wafers and work out all the sort of kinks that you might have in a new factory. And all the while, what they've been doing is building a pipeline. Now, regular readers and subscribers know how we feel about pipelines and how important revenue is. So I thought maybe we would uh, talk a little bit about this. So they have this $18 billion pipeline. You can see here that it's largely automotive. So 70% of the pipeline over the next five years will represent automotive. And of that, 80% will be going to inverters. And then you also have non-auto here that you see in the teal, I suppose. And this represents their pipeline and it's based on uh, something that we had to do a little research on, which they refer to as design-ins. Now, there wasn't a lot of collateral out there explaining how this works, but you may have heard the term design win, and more or less, they're supposed to be the same thing. So let's say you're a vehicle manufacturer and you're designing a vehicle that you're going to produce in four years time, and you're putting together all the components, and then you go to Wolf Speed and say, you know what, I'd like to use some of their uh, sick chips and they say, all right. Uh, and then everybody has a bit of a chat and there's no promise there to buy, but they say that when you have a design win or a design in, there's an 80 to 90% likelihood that you'll actually be selling the components. So they look at this as a fairly predictable pipeline. And what happens is when you have that design win, then 
you will realize that revenue at some point down the road. So for example, in 2021, they had $6.4 billion in design wins. And here's how they expect to realize that revenue over time. It's quite interesting for each of the different categories. So when we look at pipeline and design ins and, and metrics like that, we don't put a lot of credibility into that. We put more focus and emphasis on revenues. And when we look at revenue growth and their guidance, that seems to be pretty promising. So you can see this is a chart taken from Yahoo Finance in 2019. You can see where they were at there. Um, they were essentially retooling. And I'll put a link to the piece we wrote back in 2019, which looked at um, this firm, which used to be called Cree. And some of you might uh, know that name well. Uh, it's associated typically with LEDs. And they sold their LED division, and now they're a pure silicon carbide play. It's quite interesting that they were able to make the transition that they said they were going to do. And back then they had their revenue estimates and they came under those, but of course you have the Rona to blame for that. But they seem to be executing quite well. And you can see here how the recent results really showcased the progress they're making towards growing revenues. And when they announced 2022 fiscal year uh, earnings. They also talked about how 2026 guidance that they had of 2.1 billion is increasing by 30 to 40 percent. That's a pretty big number, right? Uh, in terms of an increase. And then the uh, by 2024, they're expecting to have 1.5 billion. So that's going to be double uh, the revenues of 2022. And they also expect to see their margin expand from the 30s to the 50s. And that's quite important. So they have a 132 page investor deck, which I wouldn't recommend that you go through because it's rather painful. And we had to dissect it to try to figure out what's going on with this firm, but it shows how they plan to get the, those uh, margin expansions. And as we said earlier, uh, you know, some of it has to do with the size of the wafer, the fact that they can get a lot more yield out of a single wafer and the cost is only increased by 20%. But they also have other plans which will help them realize that profitability for a, a, a semiconductor firm, a devices, you could say, firm. I think that, you know, 50s uh, gross margin is uh, a, a pretty impressive stuff. So, um, I guess that also brings up recurring revenues, which they don't have. And we've typically never been. Uh, fans of, of firms that don't have some sort of recurring revenue element. And the other thing to note is that Wolf Speed's valuation um, isn't ridiculous. It's, um, I'd say, maybe about around average. So we broke that down uh, using our simple valuation ratio market cap divided by annualized revenues based on this last quarter. And they have a valuation ratio of 15. Well, NVIDIA has a ratio of around 14. And here we've put uh, the names of some other firms in our tech stock catalog and their corresponding valuation ratios. So you wouldn't say that it's excessively overvalued even at that 30% pop. But the one thing that um, we didn't care for much, and um, I, I think that ties into the whole investor relations conversation. That's been an ongoing theme when we look at firms like Cognex or Altair Engineering. You have to provide investors with sufficient information to make decisions. And the problem with Wolf Speed is that they, and it, you know, we see this often with electronics firms in particular, they provide a lot of detail. I mean, how many people out of a thousand are going to have any clue of what this slide is supposed to be telling you? It, 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 who knows? Probably maybe two people out of a thousand. So who they're building these investor decks for, and this is the generic investor deck from November of last year, it hasn't been updated very recently, found on their website. It's 132 pages that you have to sift through. And there's a lot of slides like this that just don't make sense to anybody except individuals in the industry. And that's a uh, common mistake to make, uh, typically by engineers who um, just assume that everybody else has the same level of knowledge that they do. And it doesn't translate very well to educating investors about what a firm does. So I think there's four things that Wolfspeed needs to change to make the stock more appealing to investors. The first is to provide downloadable quarterly results, not the uh, text uh, 
based press releases that are linked to on the website, but an actual deck with key metrics that investors can pay attention to. Don't make them sit through an hour of audio only earnings call where somebody reads from a script and then they answer questions where then you have to sit and try to extrapolate the key metrics and messages from that call. That's not something anybody has the time for except analysts that do this stuff for a living who this uh, entire investor relations effort seems to be catered towards. And then don't slap a cover sheet on the 10K. This A lot of firms do this, it's rather annoying. You have this beautiful glossy cover sheet and then it immediately goes into the 10K they file with the SEC. And we all know how fun those are to look at. And perhaps they could replace that 132 page investor deck with something more concise and accessible. And of course the argument is that Firms that spend a lot of time executing, and they seem to be doing that quite well, getting things done, don't have time to do a lot of window dressing. Fair enough, but that was certainly a criticism that we had of the firm. Now, just to conclude, they're a market leader in Silicon Carbide. It's a great place to be. They're a pick and shovel play on exciting trends in the semiconductor industry, exposed to things like electric vehicles, 5G, renewable energy. Uh, the future potential of SICK extends well beyond the automotive work that uh, Wolf Speed will be doing for the next five years uh, into things like industrial motors, which consume 45% of global energy. The cons would be, of course, largely company specific risk, particularly operational risk around that New York factory. I mean, what happens if, you know, they start running into problems there or, you know, you could think of any number of uh, impediments that could happen, which would, you know, delay their, you know, or let's say change that really optimistic guidance. And then you'd sh see the shares plummet. And then of course, that's a good buying opportunity because they're likely to be able to work through those things. They probably could use some better investor relations. And of course, the fact that they don't have recurring revenues, they're a chip company and they need to keep selling chips. Well, it seems like there's plenty of demand for that going forward, at least for the next decade. So we actually came away from this research with a lot more of a rosy picture than we thought we would have looking at wolf speed. And of course it's quite forward looking, but it really makes a lot of sense and it's um, a rather unique play. So I would be very eager to hear from people who have more cons, who can pose more threats to this this firm and can essentially build up that bear thesis a bit more because I think this presentation was probably one of the few that we do where it largely surrounded, you know, optimistic uh, forward looking analysis. And I think that the reason this firm has some credibility is because when we looked at them three years ago, they've pretty much executed against what they said they're going to do and they seem well on track to continue their market leadership and to focus solely on the silicon carbide opportunity so please put your comments in the comments section make sure to subscribe to our channel thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today